Okay, welcome back. Now that we've learned about both cortical and subcortical strokes, let's move down to the brainstem. With brainstem strokes, localization starts to become much more complicated. But before we get into these specifics, first things first, how do we even know that we're dealing with the brainstem stroke in the first place? The pattern that should immediately make you think it's in the brainstem is the presence of crossed findings where deficits in the face are on the opposite side as deficits in the body. Take a few moments to repeat this to yourself. Crossed findings equals brainstem stroke. Crossed findings equals brainstem stroke. Crossed findings equals brainstem stroke. Once you have a sense that a lesion is in the brainstem, your job then becomes to figure out exactly where. There are three questions to answer here. Number one, what part of the brainstem is the lesion in? The midbrain, the pons, or the medulla? Two, is it more medial or lateral in this region? And three, is the lesion on the right or left side? To answer the first question, we'll need to use what we know about the cranial nerves in each region. Recall the rule of fours, which states that the first four cranial nerves exit from the brain and midbrain, with three and four specifically exiting from the midbrain, while the middle four exit from the pons and the last four exit from the medulla. The presence or absence of dysfunction in these nerves serves as a helpful map of sorts to tell you what part of the brainstem has been affected on an up-down axis. For example, if someone presents with an oculomotor nerve palsy, the lesion is likely to be at the level of the midbrain. In contrast, someone presenting with facial nerve paralysis is likely to have a lesion at the level of the pons, while a patient presenting with hypoglossal nerve paralysis is more likely to have a stroke in the medulla. To answer the second question, whether the lesion is more medial or more lateral, it can be helpful to think about which structures are found medially in the brainstem and which are found laterally. There are four main medial structures to think of, and luckily they all begin with the letter M. The motor pathway going to the body, the medial lemniscus carrying fine touch, vibration, and proprioception, the medial longitudinal fasciculus that controls movements of the eyes, and the motor component of some cranial nerves, including the three nerves controlling eye movements and the hypoglossal nerve controlling the tongue. In contrast, there are four main structures that are found to the side that each begin with the letter S. The spinocerebellar pathway connecting to the cerebellum, the spinothalamic tract carrying crude touch, temperature, and pain, the sympathetic pathway traveling to the face, and the nuclei for several sensory neurons coming from the face via the trigeminal nerve. The presence or absence of any of these functions can help you figure out the coordinates of the lesion on a medial lateral axis. Finally, to answer the third question, which side the lesion is on, in general, you can expect that deficits in the face will be ipsilateral to the side of the lesion, while deficits in the body will be contralateral to the side of the lesion. This is because the cranial nerves exit from the brainstem and innervate structures on the same side, while motor and sensory pathways traveling to the body all cross further down. And with these basics reviewed, you are now equipped to localize lesions in the brainstem. Let's walk through a few cases together, starting with the medulla at the bottom and working our way up. As its name suggests, medial medullary syndrome involves a lesion in the medial medulla. This manifests through contralateral hemiparesis of the body, but not the face, contralateral loss of epicritic sensation, and ipsilateral tongue weakness. Notably, protopathic sensation is intact. Let's see how we could have predicted the location of this lesion based on the clinical findings. First, we know we're in the brainstem because of the presence of crossed findings, with contralateral hemiparesis in the body, but not the face. Next, we can figure out the level of the lesion by determining what cranial nerves are involved. Given that tongue movement maps to the 12th cranial nerve, we can feel confident saying that this lesion is localized to the medulla. The tongue weakness will be ipsilateral, since you lick your wounds. To determine whether the lesion is medial or lateral, consider that the motor pathway, motor function of the hypoglossal nerve, and epicritic nerves traveling in the medial lemniscus are all involved, while side structures such as the spinothalamic tract are not. Based on this information, we can determine that the lesion is in the medial medulla. On test questions, you may sometimes get asked not only to identify where the stroke is, but also what artery is likely involved. Medial medullary syndrome is typically caused by a stroke in the anterior spinal artery. There are some key words you want to associate here. You need to link medial medullary syndrome, the anterior spinal artery, and the clinical findings of tongue weakness and other motor findings. The best way to do that is by focusing on all the M's in the word medial medullary and thinking of the McDonald's arches.
Do you use your tongue to eat hamburgers and fries that McDonald's sells? The golden arches also resemble the anterior spinal artery itself. So when you hear medial medullary, think of the McDonald's arches to bring all these concepts together. In contrast to medial medullary syndrome, lateral medullary syndrome involves loss of protopathic sensation contralaterally in the extremities and ipsilaterally in the face. Ipsilateral Horner syndrome, problems with balance, including ataxia vertigo and nystagmus, and difficulties with both speaking and swallowing. Our first clue that this is in the brainstem is the crossed findings. Our next clue comes from looking at the cranial nerves involved to determine the level. The presence of swallowing and speech difficulties strongly suggests involvement of the glossopharyngeal and vagus nerves, which are the ninth and 10th cranial nerves, and therefore exit from the medulla. To determine medial versus lateral, let's look at whether the structures involved are found medially or to the side. Given that there appears to be involvement of the sensory pathways such as the spinothalamic tract, the sympathetic nervous system with ipsilateral horners, and the spinocerebellar pathway with ataxia vertigo and nystagmus, we can conclude that this indeed involves the side of the medulla rather than the middle. Lateral medullary syndrome is associated with a stroke in the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. So a stroke in the pica leads to problems with chewing. You can remember this by thinking of the Pokemon Pikachu. This should help you associate a stroke in the pica with some of its most specific findings, which in this case involve difficulty with chewing and speaking. Moving on from the medulla to the pons, lateral pontine syndrome is in many ways quite similar to lateral medullary syndrome, which we just talked about. This is because the medial lateral axis of the lesion is the same. So many of the same findings, including loss of protopathic sensation contralaterally in the extremities and ipsilaterally in the face, ipsilateral Horner syndrome, and ipsilateral cerebellar deficits will still be present. Instead, only the level of the lesion has changed, meaning that different cranial nerves are going to be involved, with cranial nerves five through eight now being at play. With the seventh cranial nerve affected, facial sensation and loss of taste from the anterior two-thirds of the tongue can appear. In addition, involvement of the eighth nerve can result in partial or complete deafness. Lateral pontine syndrome is associated with a stroke in the anterior inferior cerebellar artery. Just as we can use Pikachu to remember some of the more specific findings of lateral medullary syndrome, we th can think of the AICA as causing problems in the FAICAIL sensation. Just as lateral pontine syndrome is very similar to lateral medullary syndrome, so too is medial pontine syndrome similar to medial medullary syndrome, with crossed findings and motor involvement. As before, the main distinction has to do with the cranial nerves involved. The motor component of cranial nerves 5 through 8 involve facial muscles and extraocular eye movements, so medial pontine syndrome can also lead to facial asymmetry and horizontal gaze palsy. However, there's also another medial structure that we need to account for in the pons that wasn't in the medulla, the medial longitudinal fasciculus. This means that medial pontine syndrome can produce internuclear ophthalmoplegia, which we covered in an earlier video on the visual pathway. Medial pontine syndrome is associated with occlusion of branches off of the basilar artery. So blockages in these branches can present as facial asymmetry and internuclear ophthalmoplegia. You can remember this association by thinking of the phrase, branches off the base lead to problems in the face. Moving upward, we will now talk about a medial midbrain stroke. Like all brainstem strokes we have talked about so far, midbrain strokes will produce crossed findings. However, because only two cranial nerves exit from the midbrain, the ocular motor and trochlear nerves, the crossed findings will tend to be more subtle, involving only eye movements rather than a more dramatic presentation like facial asymmetry. However, the rule of crossed findings still exists, it just involves less nerves than before. Instead, your primary clue to a midbrain stroke will be an ocular motor nerve palsy, manifesting in ptosis, medriasis, and a down and out position of the pupil, in addition to some form of motor findings. Depending on the exact areas involved, the motor findings can present in a variety of different ways. The condition most classically associated with the medial midbrain stroke is called Weber syndrome. Weber syndrome involves the combination of an ipsilateral ocular motor nerve palsy and contralateral hemiplegia. Those are the cross findings so that you know it's in the brainstem. So how can we remember Weber syndrome? Think about what happens when you're walking and suddenly get a spider web in your eye. 
you immediately try to close the eye on that side, and you will likely try to use your ipsilateral arm to swipe the spider web away, meaning that the contralateral side stays still, almost as if it's paralyzed. Go ahead and do these motions a few times. Close your eye and use your ipsilateral arm to swap the spider web away while keeping your contralateral arm paralyzed. That's Weber syndrome, and it's what you see with the medial midbrain stroke. The last stroke we'll talk about is a stroke in the basilar artery itself. As seen in this image, the basilar artery runs alongside the pons, medulla, and sends off branches to the midbrain. Because it supplies all three parts of the brainstem, a stroke in the basilar artery can have wide-reaching and severe consequences. One possible manifestation of a basilar artery stroke is known as locked-in syndrome, a tragic condition in which someone is completely paralyzed due to damage of the corticospinal tract as well as most of the cranial nerves. However, because cortical functions remain intact, the person is usually completely aware of their situation. Depending on the extent of the damage, higher cranial nerves may be spared, so someone with this condition may be taught to communicate using eye movements and blinks. Overall, locked-in syndrome is a devastating reminder not only of the differences between cortical and subcortical functions, but also of just how important the brainstem is for our ability to function. And on that depressing note, let's take a moment to celebrate getting through this video. This is dense stuff, but there's a logic here that makes it so that any time you spend learning will be greatly rewarded on boards and on awards. If you want to test your knowledge with some practice questions, which I highly recommend that you do, there are some in my book Memorable Neurology which is available on Amazon using the link in the description. Until next time, good luck.